So uh, welcome everybody. We're already uh, almost 40 people here. That's great. So uh, we're going to start right now. And um, if anybody sees anything that's settings are not right or something, just let me know. I'm trying something new today because the Zoom functions just don't seem to be doing it. I've downloaded several and they're all not very good. So I've changed the resolution of my screen today. So then it should look bigger for everybody. So let's see if that works. So um, just on Zoom, okay, as always, keep the audio and the video off, please. Um, just put your question in the chat. I do check the chat. But if you feel like you, I'm, I keep, I'm keeping on going when actually I should be uh, answering your question before continuing, then you're welcome to uh, just unmute and just tell me your question and then I will answer it. Um, uh, also, if you don't want to see it, because this is a meeting rather than a webinar, because I want the option that we can actually communicate via video if necessary. So this is why uh, everybody's video is enabled. And unless you tick this little box here and pin my video, you're going to see lots of other people's empty videos. So make sure you pin my video so you can see my hands uh, and my face. Um, and then uh, it's going to be a better experience. Um, also, for everybody who has Lightroom, uh, welcome to open it. Um, quite some feedback that I got on the questionnaire is that people would like more interaction. Um, I'm just a little bit worried that if we start interacting one-on-one, -on -one, then it's going to be a bit boring for everybody. So I'm going to try keeping this Lightroom series to four sessions. This is the third. Um, but what you can try and do is, you know, switch forwards and backwards with Command Tap or Alt Tap on uh, on Windows. Uh, to switch between your Lightroom, quickly do what I've been doing and switch back. It's an option or easier just wait for the YouTube video afterwards and then go through it step by step. Um, I'm happy to explore a more personal approach uh, uh, later on, but now we've got 45 people in there and I don't want 40 people to look when one person is having specific questions. So that's my advice, just tap forwards and backwards. Um, okay, I'm not going to uh, talk about myself anymore. You guys, uh, most of you have been here before, but for those who haven't, my name is Simon Lorenz. I'm a scuba diver and photographer, and I write articles and uh, talk at dive shows, and photography is one of my big topics. And I like to coach people on their photography, and so this is where this also came from. Um, this is uh, our company, Insider Divers, so we do lots of uh, different kinds of dive trips, both land-based and liveaboard. We do specific trips like wreck trips or free diving trips or also photography workshops. Uh, which was actually the first trip this year that we had to cancel, unfortunately, due to the virus. All of our trips are group trips, so we're always in a group, and there's always an expert, at least one, so like me or one of the other guys. Um, and uh, we make sure that it's a specialized itinerary, that we do special things to make it really worth your time. And we focus on education and coaching. Never stop learning. I actually made a t-shirt with that. Never stop learning is what our motto is. We want to make sure that all of our divers keep developing um, and learning about their marine environment, or in this case, about photography. So um, that's part of all of our trips. Okay, so where were we? We did part one, organization and export. Part two, we did uh, a lot of the simple fine tuning. Today, we're going to do the really detailed stuff. And I'd like to say this is where the music happens. So uh, crop, object removal, that's simple. But partial editing is essentially uh, where we really can make a big difference. So that's what we can spend most of our time on. And I've moved Watermark to next week where we're going to do all kinds of special topics. Um, and so there we will actually touch base with Watermark as well as Photoshop. So for those who haven't downloaded Photoshop for next week, have Photoshop downloaded. I'll say a couple things about Photoshop. So today, Lightroom editing part three. We're going to be uh, doing crop spot area removal, uh, an area removal, radio filter, gradient filter, and then brush. So let's go into detail editing. The first one that we do is crop. Super easy. It's in the same bar. It allows us basically to uh, apply the rule of thirds. If you don't know how to apply the rule of thirds, just join my underwater photography training in two weeks. I'm going to go really in the basics of framing and how to place your subject in the photo. That's not really an editing question, but what you can do here is if you didn't align the photo properly, you can crop it slightly to make it fit. Uh, most photo competitions will let you crop 20% or 25%. So cropping is not a crime. Uh, and if you're not putting it to competition, you know, by all means, just crop as much as you like, as long as you like the photo afterwards. 
Um, the crop tool actually gives you a grid. So you have a nine piece grid, which allows you to plan a little bit for the rule of thirds. Um, you can, for example, also get rid of subjects that are bothering, disturbing from your main subject. You can see here on the right corner, there is a, a fish that swam into this, you know, kind of perfect moment. So I just cropped that guy out um, and recentered my, my, uh, my fish. Um, you can also do a portrait. Um, that's kind of a bit difficult how they make that available. So I'm going to show you in a moment how to do that. But essentially, you just drag the slider up and then you will get a, a, a portrait crop. So let me switch into Lightroom and uh, let's not take this one, but maybe let's take this one from uh, from Chef, who I don't know if he's joined by now, but let me just move this away. So here we've got a typical situation, good moment, uh, people in it, uh, whale shark is completely in it, but you're swimming backwards trying to take the photo. So there's your fin in there. So here in the top right, so I've got this tool here. Unfortunately, I can't use the tool to actually click something. So here in the top you, left of this bar, you have the crop and all of these corners you can pull in. You can see you can pull each one of these corners. You can pull them in. OK, now the first thing you need to do if you look here in the top corner is you have to lock your ratio because it looks really weird if all of your photos have a different ratio. So press this button so it's locked. That means whatever you do, whatever one you use, you're actually not changing the original ratio of your photo. So uh, if you change the ratio of your photo, it's generally fraud upon. So that's why I would suggest you keep to it unless you have a specific situation. For example, you want to do a one by one Facebook crop. OK, so then you're making an, a photo edit or export just for, uh, for Facebook. And so then a one by one is fine, right? So that's okay. But otherwise I would suggest stick with original. That's what your camera can do. And then what you do is you drag here from any of the corners and you can see now that I need to move my animal into the right position. So rule of thirds, right? We want to have the sort of the eye detail and the mouth, etc., all on the crosshairs. So this is roughly what it is. You press return and then you've got your new crop. So if you want to go back into the crop, then you just click onto that button again and you will see that it's all the information is still there. That's the beauty of Lightroom. You didn't delete anything permanently like you would in Photoshop. It's all still there. And then you can press reset. So if you look at here where I'm at right now is reset. So you can see this reset button essentially resets this crop. And now I'm going to show you how to do portrait. So you see downwards movement, it stays. Oh, I just undid my lock here. So downwards movement just goes and makes it smaller. But if I'm now pulling to the top, so to the left and top, it will just flick over into portrait. Yeah. And then you are in portrait and then you can do a portrait crop. Right. Generally frowned upon, definitely you can't submit that for competitions. But I find if you like the photo better in a portrait, you think it's conveying the message better, by all means, I suggest you do that. Right. So see, I got a couple of questions. Oh, Radomir just gave me a suggestion. Press X while cropping. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Radomir just made a very good uh, suggestion. So if you press X, then if you press X, you switch between portrait and wide angle. Very, very good. And R to enter crop. Very nice. You can also press return and R both for return. So I'll update that in the shortcuts. Well done, guys. Thanks a lot. OK, so crop just one tip is stay in the original format. Um, make sure that you don't crop too much more over 20%, particularly if you like to uh, uh, submit it in a competition. Uh, if you get into the final round, you have to mostly submit your RAWs and they will see that and they might disqualify you. Um, well, I'm going to change this, drag to top for portrait. We're going to do that with X, thanks to uh, Radomir. Um, and reset to original is just something that you should do before you start playing too much with it. OK, next one, spot removal. Uh, spot removal, also super easy, but I'm going to show you today also area removal. Uh, both of these are very, very handy. 
Um, generally, it works like that, that you want to have a, you pick an area where you put your object completely in it and well, Lightroom will automatically suggest a source and then you can change the location of that source. And what we're doing here is heal rather than, uh, um, rather than stamp. Um, and so therefore, I'm going to show you how to set that up. So here, uh, clone stamp is not selected, but heal is selected. And you can see how I'm setting up my feather and opacity. I'll show you in a moment in the program how that works. And basically, you can just go click, 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 and click all these different backscatter items that bother you. And Lightroom has really made some amazing progress with that in the last few years. Uh, back when I started teaching this like three or four years ago, we always went into Photoshop for the crazy backscatter. Now you could even remove divers and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. There's one trick that you can do. You can visualize spots by uh, ticking this button. I'll show you how to do that as well. But um, this is a visualization of your backscatter and that's actually very easy to then just go click, click, click on these different spots. Now, Area edit, or I call it area edit, is essentially when we are not just having a spot to remove, but we might want to remove something like this diver here with the bubbles, yeah, or the fish in the top right hand corner. And the way we do that is with dragging the crop over the subject, and that actually works really, really well. It didn't used to work that well, now it works really, really good, particularly with blue backgrounds. So that helps us quite a bit when we want to uh, maybe get rid of some uh, annoying divers or their bubbles. Yeah. So let's just dive right into one of those. Um, let me just see which one I prepared for that. Okay, so I've also got a whale shark here. And you can see there's some backscatter, right? So now I'm going to um, this thing here in the top. Yeah, you can see the spot removal. I click on this and now I've got this circle. If you use your scroll, the circle gets bigger and smaller. You can also use your brackets, hard brackets, sorry, in order to larger or smaller. Essentially, it should be considerably larger, maybe twice the size of what you're trying to remove. So smaller backscatter like this, you can make with a smaller circle. But I can tell you Lightroom is so good right now that you pick one size and it always works. One thing that you see here is when I'm changing this is the feather. Okay, so if you look at the circle, the feather just means the gradient to the outside. And generally, it's good to be between 20 and 30% for spot removal. But again, Lightroom is so good that it doesn't really matter what you have. So I can now just click and click and you will see it will pick automatically a different source. And usually it does a pretty good job, particularly with blue backgrounds like this. You see it might though accidentally take this fish. And so if you um, if you look at this fish that I've got here, yeah, you can see the fish actually gets copied. I'm just going to undo that for a moment. So I had this watermark, uh, sorry, this backscatter, and let's say he accidentally picks this area, he might actually make an additional fish there for you, right? And so uh, therefore, um, you need to always check that the source, so this here, is still in the right place. You can also change the size of your target and you can move your target so you can change around quite a bit with that yeah so that allows you to do quite a bit for example up here you can see the fish so I would make it a bit larger for this fish and you can see it's on a pattern background no problem Lightroom will give you a suggestion but you might just pick an area where the match is a bit better And you will see nobody will notice this, that this fish was not there. Okay, so that is uh, the spot removal. And obviously we would do it for all. If you want to do the visualization of spots, you tick on this down here in the bottom, visualize spots. 
and then you can see them. Sometimes when you have a lot of backscatter, this is useful that you just pick the biggest ones. On some computers also, that might take quite a lot of um, computer power. So that's why if you click it in here, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit easier. So now let's come to the area removal. And area removal is uh, where we can actually get rid of bigger things. So you see, for example, here this fish, if I just do a big spot removal, I can actually get rid of this fish quite nicely. You can see though that I need to now really look that I find a place where there's nothing else. If I do it where here the bubbles are, then the bubbles are copied. Or if I do it here, then the shark fin is copied. Right? So a better way is actually making uh, a normal size brush. And now you brush over the entire subject. And it will make a spot removal that's shaped specific to what you need. Yeah. So uh, with a small subject anyway, that's very easy. Yeah. But for example, let's see up here, that's, uh, that's Gotham, who's also in this call. If I want to get rid of Gotham, which sometimes might be necessary, I can just paint all around him. And he will make a suggestion, like will make a suggestion. You can see the suggestion is not a good spot because it doesn't match the rest of the surface. But if I just drag this up to another area that looks like surface, well, I think we can fine tune that. No problem, we go back into this. I think we need to make a bigger feather. And once you find something that looks roughly similar, then you can get rid of the person. Now, what is much more difficult is when you are closer to uh, a, a form that you don't want to touch, like in this case. Yeah? So in this case, you want to be using the brush with no feather at all. You want to make sure that you're not accidentally touching the body of the whale shark. So the maximum that you can go is up to here. So you start there, preferably, and then you paste all of this lady in. till she's fully gone. And you can see already, even though I haven't even checked where the source is, she's gone. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't uh, do enough of that. So I'll do it again. Right? So if you don't do it fine, so this is a good example, you can see here, I should do this a bit better. No problem. I just go back into this and I can move this slightly. You see, if I put it lower, you see the bubble is bursting. But if I move it higher, just into the space between the whale shark and the bubble, then we get a per perfect result. Because guys, honestly, in my opinion, you can totally cut out divers if you want that. Because, you know, the pictures are for you. If you're going to put it into a photo competition, then you can't do that. But if you're just uploading it to Facebook, I think you should totally do that. So now we've got the, rid of the lady. We also want to get rid of the bubbles. No problem. We just do a couple of these. But as you can see, we've got some bubbles here and Lightroom has gotten a lot better with handling these. So you move the feather a little bit higher, like 25 again. And when you do this, he will already suggest you another area that is similar. And sometimes the surface works out that you can actually drag it so that the surface matches your target surface. And you can see that if you look in detail, you might see it, but nobody's going to notice it here. So it's a great opportunity to just clean up things like that. Um, if you want to do it perfect, you have to do it in Photoshop. But given that here you can do it really quickly, I think this is the better way to do it. So for spot removal, just what we just did was um, use the healing method. Make sure you've activate the healing method. Be careful with your source. You do have to check that all the source uh, uh, starting points are correct. Um, you have to be careful when, um, when removed objects are close or overlapping each other. There you have to do quite a bit of fine tuning. And then I have here the numbers for if you want to do uh, wide feather for backscatter, 20 to 30%. And if you have an area edit, so when you're doing a whole area like that, better use 0 to 5% uh, on the feather. 
If there are no questions to spot removal, any questions? Otherwise we can come back to this at the end. All right, let's go into actual partial editing. So there's three partial editing tools that I wanna show you guys today. There's radial filter, gradient filter, and brush filter. One is circular, one is basically a drag from one side to the other, and a brush filter is specific where you can brush your edits into a certain uh, spot. And they are right next to the tools that we just used before. You pick your tool, you create a mask, which is this red area, I'll explain in a second, and then you do your edits, which means you can apply your edits just to this red area. You can apply anything to this area, but the most common thing is brightening and darkening, sharpening, focusing, and changing the color. The things that we did last time, all the edits you can actually apply to a certain area. And they will be applied to wherever you see red. Red is what Adobe calls a mask, and that's not necessarily immediately uh, makes a lot of sense, I think. Uh, so I'm going to explain the word mask first. This comes from Photoshop. Photoshop essentially is a multi-layer program. And uh, if you join my Photoshop session in a couple of weeks, you will see that it can be relatively simple, but there's a lot of pitfalls because you are layering things on top of each other and you only see the final product that looks through all of the layers. So in an example, your original photo, your raw, is one layer. And then if you apply things, what we just did, a, back, uh, a spot removal would be on a separate layer. And then a brightening would be again yet on another layer. So they overlap each other, right? And if you want to uh, do specific area uh, application of effects, you mask them. And that is indicated here with a red uh, uh, overlay and essentially instead of applying exposure the top layer here to the entire picture we're just applying it to the square area which is in red I made it in red so that you can recognize it when we are in Lightroom because in Lightroom the masks are red you can choose other colors but I find red is is the standard one anyway and uh, the best one to do so when you see red then that's not the effect that we're applying. That's just the spread of the effect. And then when we tick out of it, then we can actually see the effect that we have applied, which in this case is brightness. I got some questions here. Hang on a second. Okay, Henrik is asking, uh, shouldn't the red area be protected from editing? No, the red area is where the mask is. I'll show you later when you invert the mask. So red is where the effect is going to be. That's just the logic. Yeah. So um, in order to see this red color, you need to select show selected mask overlay, which is a little tick in the corner, which I'll show you. But it's much easier if you remember to press O for overlay. And that will allow you to switch between the, the mask and no mask because you want to see what the effect is that you're getting. So essentially you need to activate that and you want to have always activated because always shows you down here you can see we've got three tools and you can see all three tools where they are. So if you don't do always on these pins then they won't be visible. So we're going to start with the graduated filter. It's the easiest one to manage I would say. And you can see down here, so I've ticked it, I'm dragging something up, yeah? And you can see the bottom is red and then it gets less red towards the top. This is a really useful tool for increasing brightness in very dark areas or reducing brightness in very bright areas. And also you can apply sharpness to your corners of your images. And the way it works is here, I'm showing it to you with the effect. So here we are just applying brightness and until the first line, you're getting 100% of that effect. And then over the next two lines, it goes down to 0%. So on this middle button, the one that you're going to be using to move the slider around, you're always at 50% of your effect. The closer these are together, the stronger the gradient is from 100 to 0%. I'll show you in the uh, demonstration how that looks. So what can we use it for? For example, you can see here, I took a photo of a uh, nudibranch and clearly uh, uh, 
too bright on the butt side of the nudibranch and on the left where we have the emperor shrimp it's not bright enough so I could use one brightness uh, gradient to make a fake light from the left you can see now there's more light on uh, the shrimp on the left and now of course I've also lit up all this mess at the top I can do a second gradient that will bring that down to darkness so it will match the darkness that we have on the other side so a simple way to fix your images with a gradient also when you have a belly area you can make that belly area brighter so we brighten here a little bit of the reef and a little bit of the manta ray belly we can brighten it or we can change colors here's one way where we can reduce backscatter you can see here on the left there's a lot of backscatter yeah and this backscatter uh, is a lot of clicking if you want to do it manually each individual uh, dot you want to correct so instead you could put a gradual filter that darkens a little bit but what you can also do is reduce your highlights because essentially all your backscatter is a highlight point your whites because backscatter is often white and then you're reducing your sharpness if you remember last time texture and clarity were our sharpness elements and they were always in plus for our photos well here we reduce them and also the sharpness slider so all three sharpness elements we move them to the left and then we place that over the image and we at least reduce the brightness of the worst backscatter like here is an example uh, this was a great situation our Christmas uh, Raja Ampa trip but as you can see we had a lot of stuff in the water now that would be a forever clicking effort to get that all out if you have a rainy day and you have nothing else to do you can do it but you can also just put one slider you see here the top is now all fuzzy it includes this one manta ray but okay I just want to show you how this whole area now has much less backscatter and if I would now go in with spot removal I would just remove the biggest ones yeah got a question on that uh, yeah okay Teresa I'm coming to it as soon as I demonstrate you you will see you have the answer to your question so uh, you may remember in the first session I said for split photography uh, the sliders are absolutely uh, necessary well uh, here you can see it essentially it's really hard to expose below and above the water that it's good above water and good below because essentially underwater we have a lot of darkness so we need to expose it that the top is not overexposed but the bottom is still bright enough but then what we can do you can see on the right side is we apply a slider to the top and a slider to the bottom because the split is somewhere in the middle we just make one to the top where we darken the sky, uh, the sky we make the sky a bit more blue and the green a bit greener and the sun rays a bit more visible and in the bottom we apply it to make the animal actually pop out more so this is literally two quick clicks that you will see in a moment how I do it um, but this would still require a lot of editing work I would still have to get rid of all this backscatter and my dome reflection and all that stuff but you can see with two clicks I can make a so-so picture into a already very good photo so if you're having a lot of trouble just reset them by double clicking on effect or double clicking on the individual uh, names or the sliders the other tip that I want to give you is that you use multiple masks rather than one and I will show you in a moment how we do that so um, I wanted to use my messed up Sri Lanka photos for this okay so here is a photo that you can see uh, well it was at 35 meters um, this is uh, Manjula knows this uh, dive yeah this is the car wreck uh, in, in Sri Lanka Colombo uh, a really really amazing um, uh, place to dive and you can see my bottom area is underexposed now I'm going to use a slider so top left yeah so this gradient slider here in the top and it will open up as a new slider okay and the way I do it so Teresa is asking me how to do the slider is I always say start from the left click the left, left mouse button and then drag towards the middle right and you want to make this at first in big movements until you get the hang of it 
So now I can move this thing up and down. And I'm first, before I'm going to apply an effect, I'm going to first show you the mask. So you remember I press O or down here, I press show selected mask overlay. Yeah. So now you can see when I move this in, you can see it's fully red here. From here to here becomes 50% and from here to here becomes 0%. If I make them all together, you can see the gradient is like a line, right? So if you see now, it's really close together. So the point of the gradient is that we spread it out a bit. So you move the, by grabbing the top one, you move it in and out. By grabbing the middle, you move it on the axis that you've come in. And now watch out when you're moving away from the slider on the middle axis, you get this little arrow right and left. And don't do it very close to the dot, do it further away from the dot, and then it's easy to manage the turning. So now let's apply an effect. Obviously we wanted to apply brightness. So I'm gonna take this mask off and I'm just gonna click here on brightness. You can already see up to which point it makes sense, right? And you can already see it's going to be difficult to do this with one. So I'm going to actually do this with two or three sliders. So I'm going to start with this one. And I don't want the blue to be any bluer. So I'm going to start with it with this. And you can see also we've got greenish color on the uh, fish. So we can actually just make this a little bit more red and yellow while we're at it. Add some sharpness to it. And so we've now done this part. Now, instead of clicking done or getting out of it, you can see as soon as I go away from this line or this line, there's this crosshair coming up. And this crosshair, you can just drag a new one and it's exactly the same settings. And you apply them to another place. Right? So now we've got two. Why don't we do a third one so you can see the bottom of the ship as well. So you can see I've applied it now here at the top and actually Maybe I can do it even a bit brighter and a bit more colorful. I can just add colors here. Now I want to match these colors to the slider that I'm having down here. No problem. I can just make this look more red, more saturation. No problem. All right. And so now I've done multiple gradients in order to uh, brighten this area. Here was a photo where I did like everything way too dark. And if I do the same thing, I can just bring this photo entirely back with just a couple of clicks. You can see I've already brought all the detail back that was gone before. So that is how we use the gradients. Uh, and I will use more gradients a bit later. So I will switch back to the presentation to talk about the next one. Unless there are questions on gradient, I would go to radial filter. Any questions on radial filters? Okay. So the radial filter is the same. It just applies it to the circle. So now we're making circular motions and it helps us to apply it more like a spotlight, which you will see is very useful. So you're having a specific area, but you're not starting from the corners. You're actually highlighting the subject and it allows you to make uh, do for some lighting that you might have messed up in your photo. So for example, here you can see I can make the, the there is strobe light on the belly of the whale shark or on the chin of the whale shark. But if I add a radio a filter like that, it looks like it is brighter. Here you can see also a very good example. Nothing else changed but I put two of these radial filters onto the anemone bush. You can see everything else is the same, but essentially it looks like that it's much better lit up than it was. And the sooner you learn that this is available to you, the less time you spend underwater trying to take a good photo because you know you've got this information left. Patrick is asking if you overlap two, do they double up? Yes, they do. So here, actually, if you look on my radial filter, I actually applied two. So you can see the one that's active and there's a second one down here because 
as you can see on the left photo, the original, it's very dark down there. So I put one onto that to even it out with the top, and then one on the entire thing to brighten the entire thing up. So yes, they do duplicate. Uh, uh, Vito asked earlier if they're okay in photo competitions, and yes, it's part of uh, burn and dodge, which means brightening and darkening, and that is permitted in practically all photo competitions. So here we also have a feather. Um, so a feather is essentially how this spreads. A feather of 100% essentially means the effect spreads from the center to the outside, and actually with the radio filter a little bit outside of the circle. And if you put it to zero, it essentially will make a circular uh, adjustment. But you don't ever want to use that because it will look unnatural. So, okay, next thing we're going to discuss is inverting the mask. Um, so when you tick that little thing invert, you get uh, the mask inside the circle. If you untick the invert, you will get the mask everywhere outside of the circle. And the feather is essentially going towards the effect being zero in the middle. So um, the inverted mask is useful for subject highlighting, um, sharpness on the subject. So if you want to just put details on the face, for example, but also you can create that fake strobe light that we mentioned earlier or not inverted is when you untick that everything outside. And that's essentially where you can darken your outer areas. You can call it sort of fake vignetting. And also you can use it for a fake bokeh. So making the background a bit less sharp. So uh, here is the vignetting. When you just darken the outer areas, you can see I've put a, a not inverted mask and the outside gets darker. Here, for example, I am making one of these masks on the turtle, but the actual mask is on everything else. And then if I go on uh, reducing the clarity, the texture and the sharpening, that outside area becomes uh, unsharp. And I'm not recommending that you do that, but there might be situations where you find it uh, easy. So let me switch over to the program. This is the photo we edited. And you uh, can see here that the uh, side areas we already took care of with the gradient sliders and you can now take care of the center with a circular so you could do if you wanted to the middle with the center one so apply make your color adjustments sharpness so if we compare before you can see that it was all really, really dark to after. You can see now that we've corrected all of this. And to come back to Patrick's question, if they top up, they all top up. So now that I've applied all of these, I can actually do my general adjustments and it will be the entire picture, including those gradients. So you can see I didn't do a marvelous job here over here, but for just showing quickly, you can see that how it would work. So my texture and my clarity, I could still apply could reduce my darkness a little bit. Tonality, there you go, okay? So I often use the sliders before I use the main ones just to fix the problems that I see in there. So let's just go uh, and see if we find one where we can use So in here, for example, if we now wanted to, let me just quickly do the brightness adjustment, so, sorry, the uh, color adjustment, so you can see here already I tapped that. Now, if I wanted to, for example, make this second school also come up, that will be perfect for a radio filter. I put a circle on it, and I have to find, oops, A way how I can make it fit exactly on there. Not that ideal. I'm going to show you a trick later on, guys, how to um, make that more fitting. But this is one way how we could do it. So we could brighten it, right? We could change the colors so that they actually look the way they look, right? And just because this corner is dark, we could just add a little bit of brightness here from this side and a little bit from this side. So 
that is how we use the circle. If we want to do an inversion, so where we actually um, invert, let me just find one which is good for that. So let's take this turtle one, for example. So you remember earlier I corrected it, making the turtle brighter and the background sharp, less sharp. But what I could do, I could also just invert a mask. You can see in the bottom right here, it says invert. Yeah. So if I untick that, now the effect is applied to the outside. Actually, I'm saying this wrong. Actually, invert is when it's in the center and unticked invert is when it's on the outside. So Roman meant, made the, the comment earlier, so that's correct. So when I tick invert, it goes to the middle and when it's unticked, it's on the outside. So yeah, sorry, I said that the, right, other way, the wrong way around. But here, if I now would darken this slightly, you can see now that I could just darken the outside a little bit. Maybe this is a bad example because we've got a dark area here already. But sometimes it helps to defocus on or make more focus on the subject. Yeah. And um, yeah, I could still brighten this area, for example, with just a slider and brighten that up, change color. Right. So that is what you can use it for. So yes, I did say that's wrong in my presentation um, is the um, is the uh, invert is actually when it's in the middle and the other way around is when it's on the outside. Um, Mauro is saying that slide filtering is not allowed in most competitions. Um, if you do it a little bit, I think it's fine. I know because I've won a few like prizes where I actually used it a little bit, but you need to send in your role and they will check. If you're far away from your role and you're, for example, removing large objects, definitely you cannot win. But if you're just putting gradient, some specifically say that vignetting is allowed, for example. So it really depends. And some competitions are stricter than others. So before you submit to competitions, you anyway have to check all of their specifications. And there it will often say what is allowed and what isn't. Um, Teresa is asking about clone and heal. If you don't mind, I will answer that at the end because we're already at the next one. But in a nutshell, clone is copy. So you would just copy the identical thing to somewhere else, which doesn't have a very nice effect with backscatter unless you have a very blue background. Um, so there's not many situations where you would use clone in uh, in Lightroom. Okay. So to summarize, radio and gradient filters are good for brightening, darkening, and sharpening, applying to wider area um, rather than something specific. Because the brush filter that we'll do now actually is for a specific area. Remember that you can apply multiple masks on top of each other, overlapping each other to create a uh, total effect together. Right? And invert for highlighting, so that's the other way around. So invert it for, uh, uh, or uninvert it for highlighting um, if you want to do a highlighting of a subject. So now we come to the most versatile one, which is the brush filter. Now this brush filter has quite a bit of things that I need to talk about because there's two ways on how to apply this brush. So you can see here, it is something that you can brush into uh, recognizable forms like that whale shark we had earlier. What you can do with that is you can apply selectively highlights. So if you just brush along the outside here and apply highlights, you can apply the highlights where you need them. You can change the face color. You can see that I painted here a little bit white balance into the face and on the hands, and I can get a natural skin color by just painting in the white balance only on the human. This allows us to do the white balance a bit different for the blue water. You can also increase details. So here, if you look at the bottom, now I will show you the picture where I brushed in some details and you can see immediately there are much more details I, mean, I overdid it a bit so that you can see the difference, but essentially you can see that there's much sharper details and, and often it is useful to not apply the details to the entire picture, but only to your subject um, so that the subject will be sharper than the rest of the image. 
And with this brush tool, you can do what I call a total recovery. So you can brush in to an area which is very, very dark, because in this case, the sun was on the left and I had no strobe. You can bring that back. I made it a bit extremer than I would usually use it, but you can bring back those details. Um, and that is very, very useful if you have photos which are not exposed properly. Right? Now I need to explain you uh, this because it is a little bit difficult. There are essentially three brushes available, A, B, and Erase. I suggest you just use A and Erase. Once you select it, there will be two circles. Earlier, like in the radio filter, same thing. The inner is 100 and the outer is 0. So the gradient will be between the inner one and the outer one. And that means essentially how fuzzy your painting is going to be. So you can change that feather either with uh, the shortcuts or again with the sliders. And you can apply the flow rate. The flow rate inside is basically how much of the effect are you going to paint. So if you're painting at 100, that means you're doing one swoop and it's going to be the effect. If you swoop over it again, it won't add to it. But if you do 50%, it will add 50% on top every time. So your first swoop is 50, your second swoop is 75, the next one is, and I can't do it in my head anymore, but essentially you add, which allows you to put a little bit more brightness here, a little bit less brightness there, and it allows you to play with it, which is very useful. So here are some examples when you have no feather, so that means inner circle and outer circle are the same, then you just get a circle uh, adjustment. If you do the feather 100%, so that means it going from the center to the outside, so there's no inner circle, then the 100% of the effect is only in the very middle and it will gradient out. What I generally suggest to work with is 50-50. That means you can brush in and you can add to the effect slowly, but it won't like take forever. Then there's a second brush. If you want to switch between two brushes, I find that a bit annoying, but there's a third brush and that one is very important and that is the erase brush. So this erase brush, you can click on it or what's better is if you use the shortcut, which is holding the option button or alt on Windows and that will activate the eraser. And while you're editing, you keep holding this button. So I will show you later, but as soon as you let go of the button, it will switch back to the original brush. Yeah. You can change the size of both of them by using again the uh, brackets or the scroll. So I'll show you how that works in a moment. But there are two types of masks. One is the normal one that I just explained and the other one is the auto mask. And that one is working a little bit differently. Um, the normal mask is, like I just said, you would br brush 50, 50, 50, and then you would just start brushing into your picture. I made it again a bit extreme, but you can see here uh, all the coral blocks have a little bit more brightness, but the center one I brushed more so that you get more brightness. That is because I'm doing 50, maybe two times or three times on the main one and just a little bit on the other ones. You can literally paint your brightness everywhere. And then if I would click on mask, you can see where I have painted more and where I have painted less. Right? What happens very often, and you can see this even with the top photographers, you can see the mask spilling, which means they try to make the whale shark uh, brighter here in this area, but they didn't quite do it and they spilled over, I did it a bit extreme, into the outside. And that is something that is, I find, really unacceptable because you can see it so easily. So, you, so this is what it would look like if you had brightness attached and it spills over, right? We don't want to do that, so we need to reduce that. I'll show you in a moment how to do it. The other thing that you need to decide on is your flow rate. Like I said, 50 is gradual and accumulative, but if you need to go quick, just flick it to 100 and just brush. So you know if what you're planning on doing is actually possible, right? And then you erase by holding the option button and you just gradually remove the brightness from that area. You can do it while having your mask activated or while uh, having the effect activated. So let me just show you how the normal mask works. So I'm going to pick image here.
Yeah, let's just take the same one, the reef. Yeah. So we've got the reef, we're in develop mode. Yeah. And now we brush brightness and a little bit of color into these areas. Now I've applied it to the whole picture, which is not what we want to do. I just wanted to show you what we want to have on the middle. So instead of doing it here, we will do it as a brush. So we go to the brush, put some brightness, put some reds and some yellows and some texture and clarity. And it's now currently set to around 50-50. So you can see down here, it's now set to 50-50. Okay, auto mask is not selected. So now when I go in, you can see my uh, brush. And this is the size of my brush, you can see it going up and down. If I change the feather, you can see that the feather will go in and out, right? But 50 is what we want to be painting with. And now you can see when I'm painting on here, it is literally like painting in detail and brightness. I can paint it wherever I want. Yeah. But here in the middle, this is my main thing. I want to do a bit more. So I just paint more, right? Because it's accumulative, it lets you paint more. And so for things like these, I find that most efficient because you can paint it and your eye is best to decide if you like it this way or not. You can see how it gradually increases, right? So let's say I would have done it too much. Like I'm now I've accidentally brightened the, the screen here. Now I'm pressing the option button and now watch what happens. Okay. When I press the option button, look here on the left where my mouse is. When I press the option button, everything changes to erase. Yeah. And I'm going to just do the same settings while holding the option button. Feather flow 50 and auto mask is off. And now if I press option, you can see on the, on the, the circle, it is now negative or it has this minus, which means now it's taking away that effect and I can gradually get rid of it. So if I put a little bit too much, like here on this reef, I could also now gradually reduce the brightness here. And if I let go, it's plus again, and I can put it back. Okay, so that is the simple normal mask, how you use it without using auto mask. So now let's come to auto mask. And I don't know why, but Lightroom just hit it in this tiny little tick mark. But auto mask essentially means that it allows you to select objects that it can recognize. And so you're able to actually very quickly mask something that is otherwise would be a pain to paint your effect into something like this, the whale shark, everybody would see if we overpaint. you remember that picture I just showed. So what you can see here is I just did one click. And you can see it's selecting only this white area. That is done by using density. And you generally want to use your density at 100. There are exceptions, but most of the time you're going to be good with using density 100. And in the middle, your plus button is the thing that needs to be inside the form that you want to paint into. So we'll do it on the same one. You'll see how good it works. But essentially, that allows you to mask directly into the, the object that you want to paint on. Right? Now, you can also put your density to 50% and your flow rate to 50%. And then you could gradually paint into your uh, subject as well. So if you want to have this additional effect that we mentioned earlier, the cumulative uh, uh, effect, then you could also set your flow to 50 and your density to 50, and then it would slowly gradually increase. But generally, I find it easier if you just start with 100 to see how the effect works. Right? Now you have to be careful when you have patterns. So a pattern like this, you can see now that the red has only selected the gray areas because auto masks will only look at uh, what it can detect as a separate form. And you can see here very easily that it will not cover all the dots, which is not essentially that useful if you want to increase the brightness of the entire head, for example. So here you would maybe use the auto mask on the outside and then without auto mask brush into the inside or and I'll show you this in a moment. There are there's another very nice trick with range selector. Now, when you erase the spill, I would always use auto mask because it's a super beautiful, easy way 
to delete the mask right along your uh, subject. Yeah, so that is really useful, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So we'll just take the same image, yeah, and I'm going to I'm here in brush mode. So you see it opens the brush. And if you look in the bottom right, I'm now selecting auto mask density 100. Let me just increase the size on this so that we're a bit closer. So now, as long as my plus is on the inside of the whale, whale shark, oh, sorry, let me just press O to activate the mask. As long as I press keep the plus inside the whale, it's adding the effect. And you can see I selected the feather of 50, which means it still is accumulative. So I can still add brightness or whatever I'm applying to this mask. So you can do it like this and it will work pretty well unless we're not touching the pattern. Once we start touching the pattern, you can already see you can already see certain things are not selected. So I would have to go in and with my plus and get them all selected. So that's not really convenient. So I don't suggest you do that. Use it on white bellies like this and don't use it on, uh, yeah, on a patterned area such as that one. Yeah. So now you can see we've applied this, but like I said, we don't want it up here. So I press negative. Yeah. So this eraser, I activate auto mask here and I can now just delete this top area. But let's say I did a spill that's really outside. Yeah, you can see here we've got a spill. Now I press option, it puts the minus and you can just go through it. And you see it cleans it up really nicely. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of fine tuning. But essentially, you very quickly have masked just the light part of the whale shark. I go back to O and now I can do my edits like a bit of brightness if I wanted to a bit of yellow or desaturation or my whatever, right? So these are options that I have with the brush tool that are extremely useful because I can just paint details in. So if we go to my total recovery file, how is that, the turtle? Let's just take another one of the turtle ones. So now I would paint obviously brightness into here. So I would paint in all these shadow areas. You can see the beak here gets really nicely filled out. Right? And now I can see how much brightness does it actually let me do. You can see because it's a full frame camera actually gives you quite a bit. Yeah. So I'll do it to until it looks a bit weird. And now you can see the bottom part has a different white balance than the top. Let me just zoom in a little bit. Right. Now I could just adjust the yellows and the reds to match the top of the head. Add a few more highlights and the whites. Right. And now you can see oops, that it's adjusted it quite nicely. You can also see that there's a bit of spillage. So I'm going to go into my eraser, press option, just delete all of that below. And we've done a pretty colossal save, considering that this was fully black, right? We could also just tick into this. And now if you want to expand that onto the fin, I'm doing this very quickly now, but I could also do that. You can see I'm getting quite some of the color back. Now I did too much, but essentially that's how you can apply it. Okay, I think there was a question here. Yeah. Roman, we're getting there. So just, uh, you can pretty much forget about this, but these are my recommended settings. Um, that's going to be in the handout, so don't worry about it. But this is essentially my settings for the normal mask with auto mask activated or uh, not activated. So uh, just forget about that. These are also 
the values. So I hope this was clear because I'm already a bit over time. So uh, I hope everybody still has time. Um, so I'm going to just uh, go into the next part, which is going to take probably another five to ten minutes. So I'm sorry that it's taking longer, but I felt this all belonged together. So I'm going to show you some um, tips of how you can do some really cool corrections, uh, which is basically you can adjust your radio mask and your gradient mask with the brush tool. So you can fine tune a little bit what you're doing, but also you can select your uh, gradients and, uh, uh, and, um, and circulars and also the brush with using a mask range selector, which is a very cool feature that I'm going to explain to you now. Okay. So um, the first one is the brush adjustment of a gradient filter. And it's the same for the uh, uh, radio filter. So you can see I've brushed here and you can see already that the 100% is extending all the way onto the leg of the diver and around the head. Yeah, that is because I added that with a brush. So let me show you how to do that. So let's just take an image, which is good for that. So let's say we use this image that we used earlier. No, I don't want to do that. So let's just say we use this one. Okay, I'm just going to use this one. Okay, so I'm going to apply my gradient filter. Same, I need to do brightness, right? And I'm just going to do one up. So now you can see everything is already brighter. I'm going to do the yellows and the reds, right? Yellows and the reds, some sharpness, saturation. Okay, so you can see that this area here and the area in the top doesn't have anything of this mask. Also, the fish here in the middle don't have anything of this mask, but we can change that. So this is best if you do this in mask overlay mode. So press O so that you can see all of this. And now in the top right hand corner, if you look here in the top right hand corner, you can see we're currently in edit, but there's a little tiny thing hidden that is called the brush. And the brush essentially allows us to make corrections. I'm just going to make this a bit more obvious. So if I wanted to add my adjustments onto this thing here, I could just paint this right on here. You can see I've got auto mask enabled. Auto mask is enabled, yeah, which means that you are now painting right into, and I'm going to show you how this looks without the mask. So I'm just going to press O again so you can see the effect. I've now painted this into this part of the wreck, and I can paint this all the way into all of this and apply basically what my gradient does in the bottom all the way onto all these areas. Now, if I want to apply it to all of these areas here, the auto mask feature will not be good because it will have a hard time selecting between the different fish. So I would just take off the auto mask and just brighten this a little bit. This is not ideal because the blue of the uh, uh, water also gets affected, but I'll show you in the next trick how we can change that. But essentially you can see what you can do with the brush tool. Um, you can add to the effect. So let's just undo that and let's do a different example. So we're brightening up the fish as we did before, right? Changing colors, brightness, sharpness, but I don't want it to be applied here to the uh, propeller shaft. So once I do that, I just go again, pressing O into my mask mode. And if I switch again here to brush, the shortcut for that is shift T. So if you press shift T, then you're in brush. Now I press option. So look in the bottom left guys, when I press option, it actually goes to erase. So it's just exactly how the brush mode is. Yeah. So I keep pressing option and now I can just paint into this thing. And because auto mask is selected, it will paint exactly into this thing as much as Lightroom can re recognize it. Right? So there's a bit of a quick and dirty, but 
Now you can see we have deleted out of the mask with the brush tool using the delete or the eraser brush tool. And if we look at the effect, you can see now that this is now fully dark. And that is how we can adjust not only gradients, but also radio filters. So if we did a radio filter, so this is the scene with the two, um, with the two uh, fish, right? So if we did a, oops, if we did a circular filter putting brightness here on these fish, we could make it smaller than the entire school is, right? Let's do the colors so that we have the right colors, right? And now press O again, shift T or just press on the brush. And now we could, I would probably use auto mask for this. We could now just add to the mask here. I'm just going to do this in effect so you can actually see the effect happening right away. And we could even paint it all the way on this thing. That would be doable. And you can see that we now have with one mask, the whole thing covered. So I did hear there were some questions. Okay, uh, Manjula, good question. So yes, depends. So Manjula asked if you can copy and move the settings to the next one. Let's just do it on an obvious one, which is this one. So here, obviously all these settings would still make sense on that next image because it's almost the same identical frame. So if I press Command C, Hang on a second. So if I press Command C, you can see now that we're, oh, funny feature here. You can see now that all of this is selected and you just have to make sure that graduated filters and radio filters are selected. Brush usually doesn't make sense unless it's the exact same identical. So usually I untick the brush, but if you want to apply the same graduated and radio filters, then you just press copy, go to the next image. I'm just gonna reset this so this is fully zero and you now and I press command V and apply it to the entire setting. Of course, you still need to fine tune a little bit, yeah, but you've got a good starting point. You can apply it to multiple images at the same time. So now I'm applying it to both images and both images are now a bit too bright because I changed the brightness of my camera. But yes, you can apply all these settings to the next one. So this was the super easy one. That one I think should be clear and everybody should be able to practice with that. The next one is a little bit more difficult. That one is what we call range selector and range selector is essentially giving you the opportunity to select inside the tool that you're using so inside the circle by color or by luminosity so in these two photos you can see that a subject is fully selected in this case we're selecting something that is darker than everything else so the divers and the wreck in the other example we're selecting something that is orange color. Okay, these two are, uh, they were only introduced a year or maybe a little bit ago and they make masking a lot easier. So let me show you in detail. So we are already on this photo. Let me just reset this guy. Okay, so let's say we would take this radiant filter and we would put it on this guy because we would like to see a bit more details of the diver. Yeah. But of course what happens, so we've applied brightness onto the guy, but all the other areas are also selected. So we go down here where it says range mask. Range mask is currently off. And when we tick that on, then we can see, oh, this magnifier doesn't let me show that. Okay, then we can do it based on color, which doesn't work very well. Oh, I did a mistake here. Yeah. Color doesn't work very well here because we've got so many colors. So here we would use luminance. 
And now we have to tell the computer which luminance we want to do. If you show the luminance mask, you can see, okay, clearly I'm selecting everything. But here you can see in the bottom right, I can reduce what we want to take. And the left are the darks. That's coming from the histogram. If I move this one up, you will see he's actually just selecting the bright area outside of the diver. And if I move it to the left, you can see I'm only selecting the diver. So that's one way you can you know, practice with it. Smoothness just shows you how strict it's going to be. So if you go smoothness down, you will see it's much more strict. He's just picking the body. So that's a pretty good result. But you can also use this luminance tool. So it's unfortunately the same look like our white balance picker, but it is a different function. You actually give him something to start with. And you can see now already he's selected really well this diver. Then you can still play a little bit more with your fine tuning, right? And so now once I untick this all again, I could now decide how much detail and brightness I want to give to the diver. But you can see that my blue is practically unaffected. So I can try to make it really sharp so you have the details, right? So before and after, right? For example, I often like to try and get skin color back to the diver so I could try and see if it's enough information to make him a little bit more yellow. But unfortunately, that's a bit too much asked, I think. So I just reduce the saturation on it. And now you can see he's got a bit of skin color now. Got a bit of skin color. I'm going to press the before button. And the after button, you can see is okay, more backscatter than anything. But if you look at the night trucks at the back, for example, that is much clearer visible. Uh, you can see the pockets are more visible now. This is, of course, zoomed in extremely, but that is where this is extremely useful for. So that is selecting by luminance. Uh, let me pick this example that I had here for um, this. So you can see, okay, here's the example with the backscatter. I'm just going to do that backscatter. Slide, um, backscatter, reducing the highlights, texture. So now we want to create focus only on this thing. And you can see that behind, it's blue. So this makes it extremely easy. So if we go into our uh, radial, for example, put a radial on top of this. And now you can see it does the brightness also here in the back, but we don't want that. So we go to range mask off, go to color. And now we have the color menu open here. And this color menu also has a selector, but this selector works different than the other one. So this selector, you start picking a color and press O so you can see what we have selected. And you see it does a lot of orange. Now, if you press shift, See what happens with my controller? There's a plus. So the selector gets a plus to it. And so I can add another color to it. For example, this one. And now you can see already it's now selected also the pillars, but not the blue. Right? I can also delete. Oh, that was too fast. And then you can show how much of the, how strict do you want it to be? So if you want it to be a bit stricter, then you can see how it's selecting the blues or it's going out on the blues. So this is essentially how strict the mask is going to be. I might want to add one more. I'll get the selector, add one more over here. Yep. And now I'm going to press O. And now you can see I can now edit only this area without affecting the blue in the background. And equally, I could do the same if I now just did a new uh, uh, radiant filter for the background. Put it here on the background. Let's say I just want the background to be a bit brighter so that the blue comes out more. Maybe I want to change the color of it. Again, I do the range mask color. Take my uh, color picker and say, OK, I want this color. That was a word that was too general 
maybe this color, there you go, that's a better choice. Yeah. So now you can see it's already selected this entire area. You can also deselect one of them, but I think we're just going to stick with this one. And when I go out of the mask, I can now edit this area. I can make this area brighter or darker. Probably want it brighter. And then I can um, change the color, for example, to make it look more blue. So now it's more blue. And I can put more structure in it so we can see more of the background. And now we've done that, but you can see that this color was too close. And now after, after I've done all of this, I can still use the brush tool to fine tune this thing. So we've selected based on colors, but I'm going to go to the brush tool. You remember the top right, the brush tool. And by pressing option, I get my auto masked eraser. I'm just going to take these pillars out. Actually, I'll just take all of this out actually. Okay. And now you can see when I change the brightness, I'm not affecting the pillar anymore. I'm just affecting the blue. Yeah, so obviously I've done this very quick, but you can see what is achievable. So those were those two uh, filters. So in a nutshell, guys, we've done quite a lot of things today. We've done uh, crop, spot and area removal. We've done uh, radio filters and gradient filters. I've shown you the two different kinds of uh, brush tool. So your uh, auto mask and your not auto mask or normal brush tool. And I've shown you how you can make adjustments to your radio and gradient filters with the brush and range selection, which is color and luminance. So those were quite a few things uh, for today. Um, now, of course, I would like to know if there are any questions to all of these tools. Yes, Manjula, you can totally use the masking to try and get a little bit more out of it, for sure. Any other questions? You could also just activate your audio and ask. While I'm waiting for that, um, I just wanted to, this last time I forgot that, these are uh, called it homework or assignments or whatever, so things that you can practice, essentially everything that we've done but try to use partial edits on various photos just so you can get different um, interactions with these tools and see particularly in the past photos that you've had where you felt like this and that didn't quite look the way you wanted it try to go in and use the three different kinds so radial gradi graduated and um, uh, and the brush tool they will very much help you in making the perfect picture and try and play around with the range selector, the color and the luminosity, because that is a great tool um, that allows you to actually select certain things. So um, um, yeah, that's uh, my recommendation. I'm gonna send you a handout tomorrow and the assignments are gonna be in there as well. So for the next session, that's the last session of this series, I'm just gonna cover a couple of specials, but what I would really love is to make the next session more interactive. So if uh, to make it a bit more structured because we're quite a few people, I would love it if people who want to ask a question and have their photos discussed online, they just send me the photo in advance and let me know that they're comfortable in speaking in front of everybody. And then we could uh, discuss photos together so you can edit these photos yourself. So just message me if you're keen on that. Um, also, if there are any things that are not covered yet, that you would like covered, please send them to me so um, that I could uh, so that I could uh, answer those in the last session. Um, I'm also going to start Photoshop after that. So for everybody who's interested in Photoshop, I'm going to do a bit of Photoshop. But essentially, I find these days you don't need Photoshop anymore. You can do it all in Lightroom. And um, uh, yeah, I'll still show those people interested in how to do the basics of Photoshop. And I'll promise you in one session of one hour, you will understand how Photoshop works. Um, also, just a reminder, guys, I'm doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. So if you're interested for me to work with you one-on-one, -on -one, just contact me. And also our upcoming talks. I don't see any further questions here. So uh, our upcoming talks, uh, um, this week we're gonna have uh, manta rays. So I'm gonna talk about manta rays 
everything that you need to know about manta rays, how, how they are deed, what's male, female, how they mate and feed, everything is in there. That's very good also for uh, younger uh, people. So if you want to bring your kids or this or something, the shark talk was really popular with sort of uh, 10 to 15 year olds as well. So uh, please bring those. Next week, same time is going to be Lightroom part four. And then we're currently working on a couple more uh, speakers. So we're probably going to have somebody from the World Wildlife Fund talk about shark conservation. We'll have a tech, uh, our tech instructor talk about uh, tech diving and how you can get into tech diving and take the scare away. Uh, we have a couple of photographers which might come on. So we have lots of interesting things coming up. So always check Insider Academy or Facebook and you will see what's upcoming. If you have any further questions to this, you can also email me and then I will answer that. This is my Facebook and my uh, Instagram. So like always, if you guys want, we can do a camera on, try to do everybody in a photo. So see how many people we can get live. Pietro there, lots of people there. Where's my phone here? All right, so many people. So last time we did a hammerhead, which I couldn't do because I only had one hand. So why don't we do, is everybody there? Why don't we do three for three, Lightroom part three. Is that weird? No. Okay, don't cover your face. Three. Oop, selfie. Ready? One, two, three. I'm going to do another one. Hang on a second. One more. There we go. Great. All right, so thank you very much, guys. Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was not complicated. Um, please, if you have any feedback, put it, send it to me or put it into the questionnaire that I send around. I really try to get it as good as possible. So please let me know if there's anything I can improve, yeah? So really nice to see you guys. Thanks for staying and see you next week or this week at the Manta Ray Talk, okay? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so long. Thanks, Thanks guys. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, start with the questions from last time. And there was this, uh, quite a few questions about the RGB being 50-50-50 as a starting point. Um, and I'm happy to say that I didn't say this entirely correctly, so I'll explain what is correct. Um, and then I got a very good question, which is not necessarily uh, Lightroom related, but it is uh, a question that is useful in Lightroom, which is overexposure. So I'm going to talk about these two uh, topics first, and then uh, we're going to start on time at, uh, at 9 o'clock, my time with the talk. So RGB, I said you have to be close to 50, 50, 50. Um, uh, Shaf actually sent me some photos that we can look at in a second. But I just looked up what the different um, RGBs are code-wise and all the grays are actually always identical or almost identical numbers. So we're not actually looking necessarily for 50, 50, 50, which is dark gray. You can see here there are some gray examples. Uh, it's 49, 50, 153 is dark gray. So the absolute dark gray is 50, 50, 50. But here you can see also medium gray is 134, 136, 138. And these are in the 200. So basically, what you want to try and find is three values that are similar, and that is going to be your gray area. So I'm just going to go over to the pictures that he sent me. Let me just see. So this is one of the photos that he sent me. And I'm going to use my white balance picker, as I explained last time. All right, and if we look, we actually are not getting 50, 50, 50 anywhere in those areas that I earlier said we would get. Oh, okay, this new loop doesn't work on this, unfortunately. So um, you can see, though, that in these different gray areas, we're getting very close to 30, 30, 30, or 25, 25, 25. So I pick one of these. The seafloor might be pretty close. Yeah, so usually this area is pretty close, and that already gives us a good starting point. So that was more like in the 30s rather than in the 50s. So I said this incorrect last time. It wasn't in the 50s, but they need to be equal, and they're probably going to be in the area between 30 and 70. So I looked at several of my photos, and the ones that have uh, daylight usually are in this vicinity 30 to 70, 
but if your white balance, the way you set your white balance in your camera is totally off, then it sometimes ends up being uh, further away from 50-50-50 than, than, uh, than you'd like. So that was one question. And the other question was uh, overexposure versus underexposure. Yero asked me that question. Uh, he's not joined yet, but uh, he'll maybe see that then later. But essentially, um, there's advice that says you should underexpose and there's advice that you should overexpose. This is not a Lightroom topic, as I mentioned, but it is a topic that is relevant because if you have an underexposed picture in a dark environment like here, there is not much saving that you can do. It will never be really, really good. Um, whereas if you have an overexposed situation, you can actually get it from a situation like this, which looks totally burnt, to, uh, oops, to um, something like this, where you can see all the detail of the shark is preserved. So generally, it is a good idea to overexpose slightly because you retain more picture information in the whites than you do in the shadows. But I personally find it very risky because I really like to shoot sunbursts and I find sunbursts are the punchiest photos and sometimes you need to spontaneously shoot a sunburst and if you're really far away from your correct light setting then you're going to get overexposure which is why I tend to just try to expose a tiny bit over rather than uh, manually exposing extremely high. But some photographers and this classic photography teaching are saying that you should always work with a plus zero three or even plus zero seven uh, underwater so that it automatically overexposes a little bit because you will retain more details. But I personally don't like to do it too much because I've had the problem of uh, overexposure where then you basically get a burnt picture. So those were those two questions. I don't know if anybody else had a question before we start in about eight minutes. Lots of people there from last time. That's great. So we can build on that. Did you guys all play with it with Lightroom? Did anybody um, practice a little bit uh, playing with the different sliders, getting better photographs? Anybody have some good news or some news of trouble we still have seven minutes before we start so anybody wants to say simon it's linda here um uh, my old camera i don't think it will take the raw images so what would you recommend as a good starting camera if i decide to go into um photography um, so the the best cameras I find in the market are the ones that have manual mode and a good raw. Um, so that means that they provide a raw that allows you to do some of those corrections that we did. Um, and so what I generally recommend and what most people recommend in this industry is the Sony RX100 Mark V um, and the Canon G7X Mark III. That's a bit much for you to uh, Hang on. quit. I'm going to write this here in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, hang on. What's happened here, everybody? So I'm going to write this in here. And those cameras are compact cameras. Okay. So you can shoot it in, uh, you can shoot it in um, uh, manual mode or in auto mode, or they even have an underwater mode. But you can learn with the camera. It has a manual mode allowing you to play with aperture, shutter speed, etc. And so it will, uh, it it will create space for you to grow into it. Some people uh, like the um, uh, Olympus Tough TG6, which now also has RAW, but I find those RAWs don't have that much dynamic range. And also the light quality is sort of so-so, and it's not a wide camera. So I find uh, you don't get that much out of your photos than when you take one step up uh, with the Sony RX100 or the, or the Canon G7X. It, the, the Canon G7X is a bit cheaper, um, and the Sony is a bit better on uh, video, but those two are the most used. There's also the Panasonic LX100, 
uh, that is out. There's a couple of other Canon ones, a couple of other Sony ones, but these two, every brand has a housing for it, um, and those are the most popular ones. And they take additional light strobes or whatever those antenna things are called. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. They all, all right. Do. They okay. all do. Even the simple cameras. Even your camera we could set up that it shoots a strobe. That's possible. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. So guys, um, maybe for everybody, um, the easiest is, so you can either email me your photos um, or you could, um, or you could, just upload them with your settings uh, on Facebook, um, on that group, because then everybody sees what I say to it. Uh, Manjula did that, for example, and that was very good. He had like a picture, uh, a screenshot, and then we could see also the settings that he applied, that, that, uh, that were applied. And so that really allowed us to, um, I can comment on what needs to be done there. So um, you can put it there or you send it to me. If you send it to me before, the session, I can discuss it here before we start. So, um, yeah, either way. Um, I have a simple, simple, simple question. Yeah. I, on, on my catalog, I have like a plus, a bar, a bar, a minus, and I don't know what that means. Yeah, so that's actually exposure. The plus and minus is exposure. So you're telling the camera to expose more or less. So if you put plus, that's generally better. But you have the TG5, so the RAW doesn't mm, do that much. And the other problem with overexposure is you're basically telling the camera, let more light in, but it will do it automatically. And automatically means that it will, for example, reduce the shutter speed, and then you get blurs, you see? So um, I don't think with your camera you should go too extreme with overexposure. It's better if you try to set it right, because uh, on the... Tough series is very easy to overexpose a picture and easy to underexpose. So you can try shooting with plus zero three and just see uh, how it goes. That's huge. Okay. Okay. I'm getting a couple more questions in here. So I'm just going to go from the uh, Henrik. My email uh, is the one that you should actually be getting from the uh, Zoom meeting, but I'm just going to type it into here. Um, and then Anna is asking me about a wide angle lens for your TG6. So for your TG6, um, there is a company called AOI that makes lenses for Olympus uh, and lots of other brands. Uh, they do have a very good one, which is called the Pro, uh, Pro 09, I think. And Backscatter also has a version of that. So it's called Backscatter, but it's, it's actually an AOI lens. And that is a wide angle converter. Actually, that's what you want. You want a wide angle converter rather than a um, just a, a fisheye because a fisheye stretches on the corners and a wide angle converter actually gets sharpness also in the edges. And there is some that are specifically made for the TG6 housing. So hang on, I just made a mistake here. I answered this to the... I'm going to put this in here. Okay, so I also, uh, Henrik, I put my email address in here. Um, and Anna, I sent you the names here. To see, see if you can find it and then just send me the link and I'll let you know if it's the correct one. If I remember, I can, or if you shoot me a private message later, I can also uh, find it for you.